Welcome to Beyond the Data. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and here with me today is Dr. Cowie from the WHO Collaborating Center on Viral Hepatitis at the Doherty Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Our session today was about uh, hepati eliminating hepatitis B and C, um, diseases spread through contaminated blood and sex. Uh, and we're working on eliminating them, but the, it's a little bit different for hepatitis B and C. Mm. So let me ask you first about hepatitis B. Sure. We have, um, it is transmitted most commonly from mother to child or from child to child, and we have a fabulous vaccine mm. that prevents that. What can we do to use that vaccine more? Yeah, so look, the, the vaccine is highly effective and very safe. Uh, I think, the scale up of vaccination, infant vaccination, particularly globally, has been proceeding and particularly in the Western Pacific region where there's uh, a very substantial burden of hepatitis B. One of the critical elements is to ensure that we can get birth dose vaccination. So getting timely vaccination within 24 hours of birth for all children, mm -hmm. especially those born to mums who have hep B. Uh, that requires some programmatic changes because it's outside the usual delivery mechanisms of the expanded programs for immunisation. But there's a lot of countries doing really well with this. So that's one of the things we need to do. There's also uh, good evidence that hepatitis B vaccine, particularly the monovalent vaccine, which is given at birth, uh, is incredibly stable at room temperature, but it's still required to be in the cold chain mm. by the regulatory authorities of most, most countries. So doing some reform around the, the guidelines for the use of hepatitis B vaccine out of the cold chain in what we call a controlled temperature chain are also really important to maximise uptake of vaccine, particularly in more rural or remote mm -hmm. areas where the cold chain presents some real challenges, particularly where the visits can't be scheduled because obviously um, we don't know when the mum's going to go into labour and, and give birth. There's also some innovations in new vaccines, and so anything, even something that's really good like the Hep B vaccine can be improved. There's been research on oral administration of vaccines or transdermal uh, mm -hmm. administration of hepatitis B vaccines, so that work needs to continue. And the other part for hepatitis B is treating those who have chronic infections because mm. it, it, leads, it can, leads to early death. That's the problem with it if you get it when you're young. Absolutely. What, what are the steps that we've been doing to make treatment more available and more people getting hepatitis B treatment? Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. The vaccine is going to address this issue in decades to come, but there's still between 250 or 290 million people in the world living with chronic hepatitis B for whom the vaccine, unfortunately, is not going to make any difference. So there's, there's a number of things we need to do. Most of those people, in fact, more than 90%, have no idea they've got hepatitis B. So we really need to scale up access to appropriate diagnosis uh, because people can't be treated unless they we know they've got no. hep mm -hmm. B. Mm -hmm. So that's, and there's been some amazing work going on in a number of countries around that. Mongolia, for instance, who's uh, got a high prevalence of both hepatitis B and hepatitis C, have set the objective to screen the entire adult population for both of those conditions and are making huge strides in actually diagnosing every adult in the country with hep B or hep C to enable those treatment mechanisms to follow. So for a low or middle income country, that's an amazing commitment. And there are other sort of champions of this as well. So we need to get people diagnosed. The treatments we have are very effective, uh, but similar to HIV AIDS, they need to be taken in an ongoing sense. So as well as getting people onto treatment and making sure those treatments are affordable, we need to develop the mechanisms to make sure that people can adhere to those medications and stick with them for the long term. And then finally, what we need to do is, as has just happened for hepatitis C, develop cures for hepatitis B. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of work going into that right now. Mm -hmm. Speaking of hepatitis C, mm. there is a cure for it. And get, so getting cured or treated for it mm. is essential to eliminating it. Absolutely. What is being done to make sure people get treated for hepatitis C. Yeah, so look, these, these cures, the direct acting antivirals, these curative regimens are an absolute, uh, a breakthrough on a global scale. Mm -hmm. Taking a chronic disease like hepatitis C, which is responsible for so much morbidity or illness and death, uh, in countries like the US and Australia, and, and in fact, obviously globally, is it's this huge opportunity right now to substantially address 
liver cancer, the fastest increasing cause of cancer death here in the United States and back home in Australia as well. So again, people need to be diagnosed in the first instance before these treatments can be given. We need to make sure these treatments are uh, as cheap as possible and that's been a real barrier in many countries. Uh, there are ways of with uh, sort of innovative financing solutions. Mm -hmm. um, back home in Australia these treatment courses uh, cost less than $10,000 per course to the government uh, which is mm -hmm. part of it was a really strong negotiation that went on there between the government and the pharmaceutical companies. But uh, they are revolutionary in the space of 8 to 12 weeks being able to cure more than 95% of people living with this condition, uh, it's an absolute opportunity now and we can eliminate, provided we keep a focus on prevention at the same time, we can treat our way towards elimination of hepatitis C, not just in our lifetime, but in the next 10 years. Wow, in the next 10 years. Uh, that's amazing to think about, that we could eliminate hepatitis C. I know uh, here in the United States, one of the concerns is the um, opioid epidemic for yes. hepatitis C because um, it has led to increased injection drug use and that in increases your risk for catching hepatitis C. So can you tell me some of the things that have been effective in preventing and or treating hepatitis C um, for, for injection drug use? Yeah, so I think that, that prevention aspect is so important and having uh, a human rights approach to uh, addressing the needs of people who inject drugs is really, really important. And a public health approach rather than a punitive approach. So things like needle and syringe programs, things like opiate replacement therapy, uh, needle and syringe programs, so making sure that people don't have to reuse syringes and needles is one of the most cost effective interventions we can do in this space. They're cost saving in fact. And uh, so whilst we're turning off the tap, so to speak, so allowing, giving people access to the means to prevent themselves from acquiring these infections, then we're able to scale up treatment. And the other point you made, so amongst people who inject drugs, if we're able to get the prevalence of hepatitis C, so the, the viral pool, so to speak, down, similar to what's been done for HIV as treatment as prevention, mm -hmm. uh, then even amongst those who, uh, where there is reuse of needles, it'll prevent the transmission. So sort of like a, a herd treatment effect, if you mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, if we're able to uh, access that priority population and to make treatment for hepatitis C something that is not just acceptable, but profoundly encouraged from a, prom prom from a public health point of view, then we will see hep C transmission just plummet. Yeah, so there'll be less around, less Less people. hep C. Yeah. And less treatment needed in the long term, substantially less, less treatment, treatment because we're preventing as well as treating. Treating, yes. Um, and today, in today's session, we did hear some about what's being done in San Francisco and New Mexico and obviously in Australia where you're from. Um, can you tell us what's being done globally uh, to eliminate these diseases? Yeah, so that now, I mean, for a long time on the international scale, you could barely see anything about viral hepatitis with the exception of vaccination for hepatitis B. At, at the WHO level, there wasn't even office that dealt primarily with viral hepatitis until this decade. So th th it's been a long time coming. Some of the real successes for HIV and TB and malaria control have been having that global concerted action and mm -hmm. clear policies for countries to follow how to adapt into their local health system. But critically also there's been resourcing, things like the Global Fund for HIV, TB and Malaria. The mortality of those conditions has been dropping since the early 2000s with that concerted political effort and adequate resourcing. And mm -hmm. so I think the contrast with viral hepatitis where the burden continues to rise year in, year out, uh, is, uh, is pretty stark. So we've now got the strategies, both globally and at the regional level and at national levels increasingly. We've got the will, um, certainly amongst affected communities, and I think that's the other key missing element here, really fundamental to uh, HIV programs here in the USA and globally has been meaningful collaboration with, and in fact leadership by people living mm -hmm. with HIV AIDS. We're yet to see that happen for viral hepatitis, and that's an urgent priority. Mm -hmm. So that we can match that strategic guidance with these amazing tools we've got, vaccination for hep B, treatment for both hep B and hep Q of hepatitis C, C mm -hmm. uh, with the sort of community engagement and mobilization that was really instrumental in the HIV response. Yeah, I, I, yeah it, was. it was. It was amazing. Mm. Um, and it's a very important part to have the people who are affected working on making the, the difference. Forefront. Exactly. At the forefront of the yeah. response. 
If, uh, if other people wanted to know where to go to find out some more information, where, where would you direct them? Yeah, so there, there is uh, increasing resources available. So the World Health Organization websites, both globally and at the regional level, have a lot of information, some of the sort of resources that I've been talking about. Uh, also the World Hepatitis Alliance, which is an alliance of community organizations mm -hmm. from around the world, has a lot of resources from that sort of community mobilization and, uh, and, and uh, sort of resourcing point of view. And you know, the US CDC here, the Centers for Disease Control website, has a lot of resources both for the public and also for clinicians around viral hepatitis, both from a policy and a clinical perspective. So those are just some of the areas that you can go and, uh, and then start your exploration of viral hepatitis. Yes, so we can together work to eliminate hepatitis B and C. It's totally possible and so therefore it's necessary. We just have to do it. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Phoebe, it's been a great pleasure. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for joining us. See you next time for Beyond the Data.